We're uh, so uh, happy to have uh, Peter Lowen as our speaker for today. Uh, Peter is a uh, professor in the Department of Political Science and the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Of course, he's one of our research leads at Schwartz Riesman. Uh, he's also the Associate Director of Global Engagement at the Monk School, Director of Pearl. You can tell us what that is, a research, oh, a research lead, yes, yeah, senior fellow at Massey College and a fellow with the Public Policy Forum. No wonder it's so hard to schedule things with you, uh, Peter. Uh, so busy. Um, and a distinguished visitor at the Institute for Advanced Study at Tel Aviv University. Um, and actually, I met, uh, first, first chatted with Peter because we overlapped um, at least uh, virtually uh, in, as, as fellows at the Center for Advanced Study uh, in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. Um, Let's see, what's the most important thing to mention? I mean, it could be wife, kids, uh, living in Toronto, grew up in North Bay, um, but has uh, published widely in uh, lots of political science uh, uh, venues and is going to be talking to us today. Peter, your title is, see, normally you have a slide up here, I can cheat. Oh. And I don't. So algorithmic governance, do citizens support it or not? Uh, and I'll let you uh, introduce Ben as well. Um, take it away. I'll just do a little screen share here and then get uh, get things going. Uh, thanks very much, Jillian. Thanks everyone for um, for joining. It's a lot. Uh, it's a lot more fun being on the other side of uh, Peter, these presentations. We're still there. Can you see me? We were seeing the hill there for a while. The sand. Yeah. Dunes. Can you see this now? now now there we, we go. got it. Four good. obstacles. We okay, got it. good, 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 good. So I can see, uh, I can see my, I can be one slide ahead of you. So that's, uh, it's like teaching, right? You don't have to be, know all the material. You have to know one week more than the students. Um, so it's really nice to be here. I'll just say it's a real pleasure to be involved with, uh, with, with Schwartz Reisman. Um, you know, interdisciplinarity, it just interdisciplinarity is kind of the, the thing everybody talks about in universities and it's rarely achieved. Um, and I think we're getting there in uh, at SRI, which I'm really, really pleased about. Um, I'll just make some acknowledgements right off the start. Have, thanking Jillian uh, for, for inviting me, thanking Jackie for doing great work, um, uh, making all this happen. Uh, and I'll thank my co-authors on this work. So Ben Allen Stevens is here with us today. Um, another co-author is Dario Siju and uh, Bart Bonikowski. And our work is funded by Schwartz Reisman and by Public Policy Forum and by, and by SHRP. Um, so here's just the top line on, on uh, what I want to talk about today. I want to ask the question about why we don't automate more decision making in government and ask the question what the potential obstacles to algorithmic government are. So um, if you thought you were coming for a talk on algorithmic governance, that is the governance of algorithms, uh, you're going to be disappointed, but, uh, uh, but maybe you'll be interested in what I'm going to talk about anyways. But what I'm talking about instead is algorithmic government, which I regard as the process of taking the decisions that are made by humans um, in a representative government, in a public service, for the purposes of serving some public interest, and replacing those instead with um, algorithms. And what I want to do just at the top, uh, top line today is tell you that I'm going to present to you four related obstacles to achieving algorithmic government. They're related because they all um, are linked to a concept of citizen consent. That is, they're linked to the idea that um, at least some of what government does is contingent upon the consent of citizens. So what we're looking for are things that will act as an obstacle between government using um, algorithms to make decisions and um, earning the, the consent of citizens um, to do so. And I'm just going to assume, though I'll talk a little bit more about it, that that is at least a partial constraint on what government is able, um, is able to do. So the roadmap that I want to go through here is... Um, is actually, and I'll just say, I'm gonna say it again, but I'll just say now that so the distinction I'm making here is not to talk about, the area which I wanna explore is, is not to talk about the, the very important and wide field of digital government. That is the, the question of how digitization can, can change the way government delivers services, for example. What I'm interested in is, is the idea that there is a whole delegated structure within government in which we rely on humans to make decisions. And those decisions are meant to be consonant with some stated or unstated objectives, but what the state is meant to do. And they're meant to be in the interest of the citizens for whom they're making them, either the particular citizen in front of them or citizens uh, more broadly or, or, or more generally. So I'm interested in these times when an official, like a person who's deciding to audit you for your taxes, a police officer deciding whether to issue a ticket or not, a border services agent deciding whether to let you into the country or not, 
when agents of government are given some discretion in a decision and they make it, they're acting as a part of government. And what I'm interested in is understanding, we're interested in is understanding um, whether we can replace that with algorithms and the degree to which citizens would consent to that or would uh, be, uh, uh, be opposed to that. And if they are opposed, what's the nature of that opposition or the reasons for that, for that opposition? So the roadmap that I want to go through today is um, to first just outline a very, very brief case for why we may want to have more algorithmic government, that is to, to um, delegate more decision-making to a series of algorithmic rules rather than to humans. Um, I want to talk about limits to the use of algorithmic government, just to put some ideas on the table. I'm happy to have these be a part of the discussion um, at the end. Uh, they're not, I think, uh, central in the sense that things turn on them, but 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 I've been thinking about them, so I'm very happy to talk about them um, as well as the more central parts of the of the presentation. I'll talk then just a little bit about the centrality of citizen consent, and this is the domain of politics as much as political science. But I want to talk about um, some intuitions that I have about and some intuitions the literature has about how citizen consent works and the asymmetrical nature of citizen consent um, in modern politics, and that should give you a sense of why looking at reasons for opposition is important in understanding whether something um, um, can be considered to be uh, uh, considered can be considered to have the consent of citizens, for example. And then I'll introduce you to these four um, obstacles uh, in terms of consent to algorithmic government. And I won't. This isn't a mystery novel. I won't keep you to the end to tell you what they are. They are the following. Um, the first is that there's not a there's not a broadly shared set of reasons or justifications. Uh, among citizens for why governments might use algorithms. There's various justifications that governments could use. And what we find, in fact, is that the variety of, uh, of algorithms are not universally supported. Some are supported by some citizens and others are supported by, by others. But in fact, there's quite a bit of variance in how much any individual reason is given. And indeed, when you kind of bin up reasons, there's variance in who supports what types of reasons for government making decisions by algorithm. The second obstacle is that there is just an apparent status quo bias, such that when we describe a policy making or decision making regime within some department to citizens, within some domain of government, and we present to them algorithmic innovations on that that may ostensibly improve it, we never find evidence that they would prefer an algorithmic innovation on average to um, the current system being used, even though at least some of them may actually be uh, uh, improvements um, over the way decisions are currently being made. The third obstacle is what we're going to call kind of reputation in reputation challenges of reputation building with algorithms, and this will be this will be a little bit more familiar. But we'll show you some results from some vignette experiments we've done that demonstrate that independent of the quality or the nature of decisions being made by algorithms, citizens are less likely to support those algorithms making decisions, less likely to agree with the decisions made by algorithms, and less likely to support them in the future compared to a human decision maker. So there's some built in bias will demonstrate independent of the quality of decisions that's inherent to algorithmic decision making. And the fourth is, and this is this is the domain of politics a little bit more, is that we find broad, we find a we find a relationship between the underlying correlates of populism, the under uh, some of the underlying um, sources of opposition to government generally and to and to conventional liberal ways of making decisions, and an opposition to government using algorithms for decisions. And this looks down the pipe a bit more, but what it suggests is that there's just a potential broader opposition that can be mobilized against algorithms that's rooted in some of the more um, negative, um, pernicious, corrosive forms of politics that we see um, across the Western world today. So that's that's where we're gonna go. Um, so uh, let me walk through this now and, and I'm happy to have questions at any point for, for clarification, um, but I'm also happy to just sort of truck through uh, to the end to 3:45, and then we can get to 3:50, and then we can get to get to questions. Um, okay, let's talk about what the, what the case is for algorithmic government. There's probably a lot of arguments we can make for devolving decision making down to um, algorithms rather than individuals. But here's at least some of them uh, that I think that I think about um, and have been thinking about. The first is that the administrative state is becoming more complex, um, not less. So you know there is a whole. Uh, 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 emerging, there's emerging industries or emerging sets of companies that are trying to help um, companies sort their way through the various morasses of, of the administrative state by using various forms of AI machine learning to try to help companies understand how the decisions they're making 
could be or couldn't be uh, consistent with the regulations with which they're they're faced. For example, right? That's that's one example of how complex the, regulus, the administrative state is becoming. But in a more general term, in more general terms, every year more regulations are added to laws generally than are than are removed, and this increases the complexity of uh, uh, of decision making within states. It can increases the number of considerations that a decision maker can bring to bear. And it increases the number of tools that they have at their disposal to use or not use actually to uh, to make decisions. The second is, and this is this may seem uh, this statement I think is either profound or incredibly daft, but you know politics relies on humans, and and public administration relies on humans, and we're obviously deeply flawed people. Um, we're given over to all sorts of forms of cognitive bias. We have. We have an, you know, an unrelenting reliance on, on heuristics. Uh, we can only work so many hours a day and government can only be so big. So that we regularly rely on bureaucrats to make a massive number of decisions and to implement policies is a challenge, right? Um, and just by the way, I mean, some of the work, other work that I've done, which I'm most, most proud actually is, is we've, we've, we've spent a lot of time with politicians at national levels uh, in big countries, administering to them all sorts of behavioral experiments to try to see if they're any better than any of us at avoiding all sorts of forms of cognitive bias, and they just aren't, right? Now, we haven't done it with top-level bureaucrats, but the people who we elect, um, in, in, indeed some of them who are most successful, are as human as we are. So we have a whole system where, for many reasons, I think practical reasons, but also normative reasons, and for reasons morally motivated, we want humans to be the final decision makers. And that's a very, uh, that's a gamble that we uh, that we've built into our into our system, um, and it's not uh, obviously not perfect because those humans have all sorts of um, of all sorts of shortcomings. And I'll and I'll give you just I'll give you one figure on that in just a second. The second the, the the third reason for algorithmic government is we have a notion. This is related to the point I just made that um, we care about procedurally fair processes. We want to be heard as humans when we have a conflict and. I think I think we can all think up at the ready examples of of people wanting to be heard um, when they're interacting with government, and that's why things like the organizations like the CRA, you know, give give opportunity for those people who are being audited to have an in-person hearing. There's a notion of procedural fairness when we can make our case to another person um, that we like as humans, but there's not always evidence that procedurally fair processes necessarily or probably lead to better decisions. And I'll show you just an example in a moment from. The Social Security Administration. The fourth point is that the state isn't designed to learn. Um, the state is designed to avoid audit. Um, it's designed to avoid uh, illegality, uh, but it's not effectively set up to learn from the decisions um, that it makes. If it did, it would do a lot more RCTs. It would have a. It would. It would care a lot more about. Uh, it would care a lot more about data. It would create clearer standards to measure whether its policies are working. Um, but it doesn't do those things, and. The, the sum of all that is that you can imagine um, implementations of algorithmic decision making, which could address some or all of these, all of these shortcomings of our current public administrative, um, public administrative state. Um, it is the case that this is being done. And I'll just, I'll just point you to, there's a very nice paper done by, um, done by uh, David Freeman Engstrom and Dan Ho at Stanford, among others. Um, and they did a very kind of comprehensive, not comprehensive, but a very wide ranging and ambitious audit of the use of AI in administrative agencies in the United States. Um, there was a class project actually where they had, they had law students work on it, um, worked on it for a couple of years and it came out in February of this year. Kind of bad timing to release anything if you're not working in infectious diseases, but anyways, they did. And it's a great, uh, it's a great report. And, you know, they find very, a lot of variation actually in how AI is being used across policy areas. So you can see in that figure there that it gets used in a lot of things like law enforcement. You can you can imagine how it's being used in law enforcement. A lot of facial re uh, recognition, a lot of uh, predictive modeling, apparently about crime, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they also, so I, I just recommend the report to you, but they break down all sorts of areas where it's being used and different tasks against which it's being used. But if you look at that figure, uh, figure two, you know, and, and they took a pretty, they took a kind of a convenient sampling approach to this. So don't take this as being these parameters as being um, descriptive of a population, but just being suggestive. But if you look at the different tasks to which AI is being used in federal administrative agencies in the United States, adjudication is the least common usage. Regulatory research, analysis, and monitoring, there's a lot of financial things there. It's being used there a lot. It's being used in forms of public engagement. 
it's being used in enforcement that is in law enforcement, but an adjudication over, over, over decisions that the state's making doesn't get used as much. There's a related paper by, by David and Dan, by Engstrom and, and Ho, in which they look at the use of algorithmic uh, decision-making, particularly in the social security administration. And I just wanna point out, I wanna talk about this figure just for a second, because I made, I made two claims, right? One was that procedurally fair processes don't lead to better outcomes necessarily. And the second was that the state's not designed to learn. And um, figure one here demonstrates this, I think, quite well. So what you have here is, is uh, a figure in which um, the x-axis is the number of decisions made by a judge, by, by, a, by a, uh, an ALJ, which is some, it's an acronym for- Administrative, for, administrative law judge. Yeah, and they've asked to be called judges, right, recently, right, to, to, to give themselves probably a driver and more and more authority. But nonetheless, right. um, there is, uh, there is uh, variation in how many decisions each ALJ has made. Some have made very few. And these are decisions about how much a person should be getting in Social Security after uh, uh, a, uh, an objection or some dispute over how much they should be getting. Um, so there's how many decisions they made on the x-axis. There's their award rate. On, on the y-axis. And if you take kind of the observed award rate as the null, it's about 52, 53%, right? So obviously you can sort out, and, and by the way, cases are, this is the key point of the figure, cases are allocated to, to ALJs randomly. They're allocated randomly, right? So the actual merits of the case are unrelated to the characteristics of the ALJ and indeed should be unrelated to how many decisions they've made, right? But you see a couple of things, right? You see massive variation around the null, right around the base rate of, of 52, 53%. Some justices are awarding 98% of cases, others are awarding 8%. Um, and you know, there's, that's not a very tightly packed uh, distribution. So despite the fact that cases are randomly allocated and therefore on their merits, they're equal in expectation, there's still massive variation in what these humans in these procedurally fair processes are seeing. And the second is, is that there's no narrowing of that variance as an ALJ makes more decisions. So as they're learning more, as they go through the process of adjudicating these cases, it's not like they're getting any better um, uh, uh, or any close to making you know, decisions at a rate that, other, that, that, that decisions are being made um, on average. So this is just, a, I think, a nice demonstration of a case where the facts are well known, in fact, about how long someone worked, um, what type of work they were in. You can elicit the facts through surveys about why it is that they were out of work for a period and whether that was justified or not. So all the kind of considerations you might put into the adjudication of a social security case can all, can all be measured, uh, uh, can all be recovered. Um, so it is a candidate for algorithmic decision-making. And it seems to me that um, there's a lot of examples like this one I presented in within the administrative state. Um, okay, so, uh, so that, that's starting to make the case uh, 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 for using algorithms. What are the, what's the case against using algorithms. I'll just, I'll just raise five objections to using them. There are many more, um, and I won't articulate these as well as others have, but these are, these are some of them. One is that obviously we have issues of supervision that it's just simply, it's simply uh, um, you can get to a scale where it becomes impossible to supervise um, in a substantive, substantively meaningful sense the decisions that are being made. Um, that's a consideration, right? Government is, 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 is uh, has the normative value of oversight and a lack of supervision implies a lack of oversight. The second is obviously issues of principal agent problems where particularly if you have algorithms that have any learning in them, for the principal to know that the learning is consistent with their incentives is, uh, uh, is difficult the more learning occurs. And I take that to be a, um, a specific case of a generic principal agent problem. The third is explainability, right? Um, best of luck, uh, best of luck expecting politician to stand up and explain an algorithm. Uh, but there's other just there's just other general problems here that citizens expect to understand why decisions were made the way they were made for the for the decision for the for the citizen. Um, there's an issue of implementation, which is simply the issue of actually putting these things in place and finding where they could be put in place in government and doing the kind of training and the and then the re reconfiguration that would be necessary um, to do it. And that might seem like it's a, a surmountable problem. Um, if you spend any time in the federal government of Canada, you'll know that it, it, it basically is the biggest repository of old computers in the world. Um, and it runs most of the administrative state in Canada on, on uh, computer systems that are 40 years old, which is why it can't produce paychecks, for example. Um, and then there's the problem that, that, that is really the one that interests me most, which is 
um, the multi-dimensional problem of citizen consent. So I want to speak about that a little bit, and then I'll get into these particular cases of obstacles rooted in in citizen um, consent. Um, I'm going to I'm just going to make the claim, and it's an important one to me. Then the long-term uh, citizen consent is going to be fundamental for the effective functioning of government. Government relies on the consent and the trust of the trust of citizens. Um, there's a number of exchanges that happen between citizens and, and governments, whether it's citizens turning over taxation or citizens turning over their obedience to directives from the state. Um, and the state can work to the degree that it is able to have citizens follow its directives. And actually, I think COVID is just a fantastic demonstration of this, that you know there is, there is substantial variation cross-nationally in otherwise democratic states in the degree to which citizens are willing to follow the, follow the health directives of, of, of members of the senior members of the administrative state and places where citizens are willing to do that are, you know, are, are, are willing to, to direct their behavior more are doing better. Um, the second is that citizen consent is tied to a number of assumptions and norms about how government should work. So let me give you, let me give you one example. Um, imagine if tomorrow it was announced that, um, uh, and I learned this the hard way actually at one point in my life, that Canada was basically going, going to move to a speed enforcement scheme on its highways equivalent to the Australian scheme, which is every, every violation of speeding is punished if possible. Okay, through both traffic cameras, but also just through, through um, traffic police who, 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 who will not abide a five, six, seven kilometer an hour violation of, of speed limits there's a strict violation of, there's a strict enforcement of speed limits. And imagine that the government uh, instead said, look, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna recover any more total revenue from speeding tickets. But what we are going to do is we're gonna increase the enforcement rate 10X and we're gonna, we're gonna decrease the fines by a factor of 10. So you know, it's gonna be even in the end in terms of how much money we take. But if you're speedy, we're gonna catch you both through, through officers, but particularly through, through, um, through license plate photo capture. Um, now, this is, this is completely legitimate in a, in a formal sense, right? If speed limits are posted, we know that it's against the, uh, it's against the law it's to, to exceed them. And yet, you know, any, any, any driver in the 401 tells you that this is just, it's just kind of a concept, the speed limit, right? Um, and you know that if you go much too far above it, you'll be fined. You might, you might be caught. The rate of capture is low, but the fine is high. But there's a bargain here, right? And government couldn't just willy-nilly change uh, the scheme from low capture, high fine to high capture, low fine without violating some sense of, um, uh, of a bargain that citizens had about that, right? And there's so my point is, there's just a whole number of bargains around how decisions are made and how laws are enforced that aren't written down that are, that are in fact informal, but they're very important for, for maintaining citizen consent. The consistency of them is important. The explainability of them is important. Um, and then finally, there's this set of things that I think are, are important. And it's, this is the domain of politics, but, it's, but there's systematic evidence for it. And it's, they're along the following lines, that opposition to government action is powerful, even in a minority, that when a minority of people find something government does objectionable, it can become very powerful. A, because it has the potential to activate greater opposition, that when a government sees that 15 or 20% of people strongly oppose something that it's doing, it worries that those reasons will spread to other people. Um, often, the second is that often those objections are forwarded by what we call issue publics, who are, issue publics are small, subs, or are, are sub, not necessarily small, but they're subsets of the population who have a high degree of interest in some issue, and they're likely to pressure government on that issue. So there's an issue public around abortion, and there's an issue public around policing matters, and there's an issue public around capital gains taxes, and there's issue publics around any number of issues. You might think of them as special interest groups, but it describes the, the sets of the population that are concerned about things. And governments respond to issue publics to well-informed, concentrated, um, sometimes organized minorities of citizens as much as it, reply, as much as it responds to um, the broad swath of opinion. And the final is that government success depends on attention in the cycle of of generating political capital by doing good things and then using it, spending it down to bring in more controversial policies. That depends on government controlling attention uh, and controlling the agenda about what gets talked about and what it's doing actively rather than defensively. And opposition to things government's doing draws away from that capacity. So the, the, there's an underlying hypothesis here. The government cares about opposition from, from, from citizens as much as it cares about consent for something. Um, 
And it's as much likely to focus on the reasons why citizens are opposing something as the reasons why they are supporting. So um, let me get in now to these four challenges for um, citizen consent. I'll just review them briefly, then we'll get into the data, okay? One is that citizens support various justifications for the use of algorithms, but no set of justifications strongly. The second is that citizens evaluate these algorithms with a status quo bias. The third is that they to hard, algorithms have a hard time building good reputation. And the fourth is that there's a broader set of animating forces here that opposition algorithms might be linked into. I'm gonna present you, I'm a survey data researcher among other things. So I'm gonna present you data from surveys. Um, all the data that we're gonna present is drawn from online surveys on broadly representative populations, uh, samples of the population. We could talk about how we treat these data in terms of weighting schemes and, and cleaning and all, all this stuff. We rely a lot on randomization here. So we're not as concerned about the precise representativeness of the, of the, uh, of the samples as much as we are like heterogeneity, for example, across, across um, observables. Um, and the data come from a lot of countries. So we did data collection in Canada, the US and Australia in, uh, uh, in 2018. And then we did a bunch of data collection in the spring of 2020 in a number of other European uh, countries. So this is what the data look like. The first obstacle is gonna draw data from all of our cases. Um, the second obstacle just from Canada, the third again from all the cases, and the fourth from uh, all of the cases except for uh, the United States uh, and Australia. Okay, so let's talk about this first, uh, this first obstacle. Um, we're gonna show you that citizens support various justifications for the use of algorithms, but no set of them um, uh, uh, strongly. And I'll skip over these points here, just I'll, I'll make them quickly, which is just that politics is about reason giving, right? That's that, that governments take actions or governments choose policies and they often backfill the reasons for doing them. And they hope that citizens take up some of those reasons. So what we did is in our surveys is we presented citizens with uh, a quick introduction to what algorithmic decision-making could look like, um, why governments might use it, for example, we gave them a couple of examples. And then we asked them about eight different reasons that they might support the use of automation. Let me show you these reasons. There are things like the following. Um, we try to put them in relatively plain language, um, but citizens might support the use of government use of algorithms by government to reduce the time required to make decisions or to reduce the cost of government to make decisions which are more consistent and less random, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so citizens in, in, in Canada and in these other 15 European countries, uh, these 15 European countries um, were given all these reasons and asked for their agreement with these reasons as, as a justification for government using algorithms in decision-making. You can bin these reasons around sort of efficiency things, right? Uh, speeding up decision-making, making government less costly and more, more uh, fairness style considerations, right? Things like making decisions unconditional upon gender or ethnicity or wealth or making decisions which are non-random or which are not in influenced by official biases, okay? So let me show you the Canadian data and you'll see the European data looks similar, but this is the level of support. This is the level of people who agree with these reasons um, uh, for the use of uh, automation and AI in government um, in Canada. You can see that there's, first point is that there's variation in how much people are willing to su support the reasons, somewhere around 60% up to uh, three quarters. So the majority of people support uh, each reason, right? But if we look at the distribution of people, you find that it's not quite the case, right? That a quarter of people support all the reasons, 10% support none of the reasons, and something like 11, 15, 22, um, a, little, a little, somewhere around a third support uh, a majority or less, right? Or, or, or up to the point of a majority um, of, of reasons. Um, and Importantly, if you, if you array people according to accepting the majority of efficiency or the majority of fairness reasons, you find that the majority of people accept the majority of reasons that are around efficiency and around fairness, 59%, but you've got something like a quarter who are in the off diagonals, right? Who accept some reasons uh, from the fairness dimension, but not from the efficiency dimension or uh, vice versa. And then you've got those who do not accept the majority on either, on either dimension. When we look at the European data, it's a similar picture. There's a, you know, almost a downward shift on every reason. So something like a shift in the constant where the overall level of support is lower for every reason. The array of reasons looks the same actually in terms of um, how much citizens uh, support them. Um, and if you look at the distribution, it's a little starker in the, in the European case and that the, you know, the modal, the modal respondent supports none of the reasons 
and the next highest uh, respondent supports all of the reasons. But there's a lot of variation in between in terms of how much people support them. We can model this out a little bit um, for what it's worth. We can ask a question about what kind of demographics are correlated with uh, the acceptance of these reasons. Um, and we can look at whether the, 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 the correlates of the fairness subscale are different than the correlates of the efficiency um, subscale. And what I'll point out to you is that people who are older support more uh, use of algorithms. Certainly people who are edu better educated um, support the use of algorithms more. Ideology has a very interesting relationship to support for the use, uh, support of the use of algorithms. And here the data are pooled between Europe and Canada just for what it's worth. But those who are farther uh, self-identified to the right are more supportive of the efficiency subscale and less supportive of the fairness subscale than those who are positioned on the left. Um, that may seem intuitive, but it's nice to see it. Net that effect, when you measure people's preference for populism, and I can talk about how we define that in the Q&A if you like, but when we measure people's um, preferences for populism, we find that those who are greater, greater populists are more supportive than those who are not of, of efficiency uh, 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 justifications, but they're indifferent uh, or, or they're undifferentiated from those who are lower in populism on the fairness subscale, right? So you imagine that you're a government uh, official trying to make reasons, trying to explain to citizens why it is that you want to use um, algorithms to make decisions and you find that there's a subset of the population that depending on where they sit ideologically or in terms of their orientation to populism, will find your reasons very convincing or will find them um, off-putting. That creates a challenge for, for politicians. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just show you that we've got these plots where we estimate it separately in each country. We can talk at the back about how we've estimated them in a multi-level way. But the story here really is that the effects are pretty consistent. The left-right effects are a bit less consistent. The populism ones are a bit less consistent. But you know, there's, there's, um, there, is, uh, uh, there is some consistency, I think, across things like gender, income, education, age. Um, these are the efficiency subscales. Um, and if you look at the fairness subscale, you get similar stories here, for example, on those who are on the, for those who are on the left and for those who are on the right, um, having different justifications, or sorry, uh, universally having different justifications for why they support these things. We can talk about extensions where we only note one for those who are really interested in digital government. There's no relationship between the experience of a country in administering services via digital means in its government. Um, and uh, or just more general digital literacy in a country and and changes in uh, uh, in the levels of support for acceptability right? or, or the rates at which citizens accept uh, reasons given by government to use algorithms. OK, obstacle one is citizens are uh, citizens have a, uh, a, a set of reasons that they use to set, a set of justifications they'll accept, but not all of them. The second that we're going to show you is just that there's a pretty consistent status quo bias against the use of algorithmic um, innovations. So what we do is we're going to present citizens with three different policy areas, uh, decisions about who to let in uh, as immigrants, decisions about which businesses to allocate small business loans to. There was a time, I don't know if you know this, there was a time before COVID where government actually distinguished who got loans and who didn't. You couldn't just get them by applying. Um, and, uh, and then finally, uh, tax filing and, and, and auditing. And the basic scheme here is we give people an introduction about the way governments might make decisions about something. So we describe the current immigration regime. Um, and then we say, but, you know, and sometimes they use interviews to decide who let in. And then we have an innovation. In this case, the innovation is rather than relying on human interviews, suppose the government decided and said to replace the interviews with a questionnaire that was analyzed by computers to select the immigrant most likely to succeed. How much would you support that method for selecting immigrants? So what we can do is we can take the status quo and we can compare it to these innovations. We randomly assign citizens to one of three innovations, one about a questionnaire, one about just choosing on um, a higher score. So basically using the, the survey as the algorithm and then the human choosing on the score and the other being a lottery, which government's now using, thankfully for uh, family reunification compared to none of the innovations. And the pattern here is the one you'll see for, uh, for small business loans and for tax filing as well that citizens are more likely to support no innovation over any of the innovations presented to them. So it doesn't matter whether the innovation is uh, within the immigration domain or an innovation that we apply, that we present to them around um, algorithmic decisions, um, uh, around small business loans, or around uh, taxation and tax filing. They always support the existing system more than the algorithmic innovation. These are not huge differences to be sure um, I mean, if you took the joint likelihood of them all being 
negative, uh, you would start to get, it would start to uh, appear more impressive. But the point is that we couldn't imagine an innovation that seemed reasonable that citizens liked better than whatever was described as the current um, status quo. An extension would be to do something like, to use a little bit of deception and, and describe an innovation as the status quo and see if, if, if there was some other algorithm that was worse and whether the status quo bias went in the same, uh, uh, went in the other direction, but we haven't done that yet. Let me talk about my third uh, obstacle, which is a little bit more theoretical in a sense, I mean, I don't know theoretical, but, but a bit, uh, slightly more abstract, but it's just the notion of, of reputation building that governments build up consent by making decisions well, um, and by making decisions that citizens um, agree with. And I'm gonna make the contention, I think it's uncontroversial, but happy to chat about it, that reputation building is asymmetric, that um, you can make a lot of decisions that people agree with, and once you make a wrong one, then you're in a position where they they lose trust in you much more rapidly than you built up that built up that trust. Um, you know, part of this is because, it, as it relates to algorithms making decisions, it's important, right? Because we make decisions about judgments about values that may not be supported by the evidence of what a decision maker has done, but which we're willing to forgive because people are human. So suppose that I that Jillian makes a decision that I don't like, right? It's reasonable for me to say, well, you know, I don't know what reasons, I don't know why, I don't know why Jillian made that decision, but I actually, I know her values. And, and I think in, this, in the future, she'll make a different decision. And we share values, so I think I can trust her into the future. Um, that's a hard inference to make about, uh, about a non-human, because you are less likely, I think, to think the non-human has a, a complex set of values that they're drawing on that would make them make a different decision under the same circumstances in the future. Um, and the other bit is that we evaluate decisions based on the nature of the decision and based on our perceptions of the decision maker, which is to say that our decision making or our, our judgments about people is motivated, right? By what kind of person we think they are, not just by the decisions that they make. So what we wanna do when we do this in, uh, in our, with our European data in Canada, in Australia, in the US, is we present people with a vignette that looks like this it's very sim it's a, just a kind of a bastardized trolley problem. So throw your virtual tomatoes, but here we go. The, the question is, you imagine that a hospital has an administrator that assigns surgeons to patients. Um, one of the surgeons working on a patient in critical condition and five more patients arrive at the hospital in need of care. If the administrator decides to reassign the surgeon, the surgeon's current patient will die. Um, and you'll see that the outcome here doesn't vary, um, but the surgeon will be able to save the five new patients. If they do not reassign the sur surgeon, then the current patient will live, but the other five will die. So there's no, there's perfect certainty in the outcome here. So, so we're not dealing with any, with any risk here, but we're dealing with a choice that's basically ontological versus, ontological versus utilitarian, right? Um, and then we randomize both the, so we randomize two elements here, right? Who's making the decision, the administrator or the algorithm, and we're going to randomize um, whether they assign, reassign or not. So importantly, what we're able to do is we're able to um, separate the decision maker from the decision in our in our empirics, right? Just with a simple kind of two by two. So there's three outcomes we're interested in. One is agreement with the decision. So we ask respondents, do you agree with the decision that was made? We ask them if they would trust the decision maker in the future. Um, and then we ask them whether conditional upon agreement, they would trust the decision maker in the future. So here we're gonna lose a little bit of identification because we're going conditional on observable, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not too fussed about it, uh, uh, just, just so you know. Um, so here's, here's how we're going to kind of present these to you. Here's a first plot from, um, oh, I'll call the Anglo-American countries, but Canada, Australia, and, uh, uh, and the U.S. And these are, these are point estimates from, a, uh, uh, from just a linear regression um, of agreement, where, where agreement you know, as, a, as a dichotomous variable is the, is the dependent variable. Um, and we're gonna, and the point estimates are coming from a basic model, one where we put in a bunch of controls about the respondent and then um, a model of an interaction between the decision maker and the decision. But the story here basically is that, is that citizens are more supportive of the utilitarian decision. That's that second set of, of, of coefficients there. Um, they're, they're more likely to agree with the decision when it was utilitarian. Net that they're less likely to agree with the decision when it was made by the algorithm. So independent of the quality of the decision, they, they are less likely to agree with an algorithm making the decision, okay? Um, you can see uh, uh, that when we interact those at the bottom, there's no, there's, there, there's no interaction effect that kind of um, uh, makes up for that. So uh, quite net of the, of, the, of, the, of the nature of the decision, there's a punishment for the, for the, uh, 
for the algorithmic actor, for the algorithmic decision maker. When we ask people whether they would trust the, uh, the algorithm in the future, you could see that the result is even more stark, right? That, that, um, that actually uh, the nature of the decision made by the decision maker has no effect on whether people would trust the decision maker in the future. But if they're given the algorithm, they're less likely to trust in the future. And just, just by the way, this is a between subjects design. So it's not as though we're presenting people once with a human and once with an algorithm, and then having them queue off of one of them. The people who get the algorithm, it's the only treatment they're getting. And those who get the, the human, it's the only treatment that they're, that they're getting. So people are much less likely to trust the algorithm in the future um, uh, 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 to make a decision. If we look at it, and I'll show you the European results, and I'll show you the conditional results. The results in Europe look, look similar, right? Um, more supportive of utilitarian decisions, less supportive of algorithms as a decision maker. When you talk about future trust, much less likely to trust the algorithm in the future, much in the European case, for some reason, more likely to, to trust the decider if they made a utilitarian decision. And then this is the result conditional upon agreement or disagreement with the decision. So the lighter blue circle is those who disagreed with the decider and whether they would trust that decider in the future. And the dark blue triangle is those who agreed with the decider, asking them whether they would trust the uh, uh, decider in the future. And you can see that even those people who agreed with the decision made by the algorithm are less likely to trust the algorithm to make the decision in the future. Indeed, the effect is bigger for them in terms of their lack of trust of that, that decision maker um, in the future. These results are, if we just break them down by country, are, are pretty consistent. So each of these point estimates is, is the estimated effect of, of the treatment, um, either the decision maker or the decision in each of our countries estimated, estimated separately. And you can see that the results are pretty consistent across, um, across the, variety of our, the variety of our cases. Um, I'll, I'll make a final point here, and then I, I think I should be able to end right on time, which uh, will be a first for me. Um, uh, and that is that there is a fourth obstacle, and I, and this is not one for which I have experimental evidence, but I'll show you some observational evidence. Um, I've got I've got a real ugly cast of characters up on the screen here for you, literally and figuratively. So there's Victor Orban, uh, Geert Wilders, uh, Marie Le Pen, uh, Donald Trump, uh, uh, and these are all. Uh, populist politicians of varying degrees of support. Um, and I just want to say two things uh, about them. One is that um, I'll pay you a lot of money if you can find a number of things that they agree on. There aren't many um, beyond not liking foreigners and having a sense that the, the past was better than the present, but the future can be greater under them. Um, and the second is that they're all pretty remarkable political entrepreneurs. So there's kind of two key features to, to populism globally. One is that it's very, very good at uh, playing on nostalgia and on a sense of um, perceived or actual economic grievance, a sense that the past was better than the present. Um, and the second is that it's just, it's just characterized by politicians who are entrepreneurial and are able to marshal together issues that don't hang together in the eyes of normal um, centrist politicians. So the question that I just want to explore as a final one, as a final obstacle, is whether there is a potential link between a sort of broader opposition to automation and AI and an opposition to government using it. And notwithstanding the populism results shown to you before at the future, I wanna, I wanna push this just a little bit farther. So what I wanna do is I wanna look at the correlates of populism, that is nativism, you know, opposition immigrants, um, a fear of economic loss, um, and to see whether these are correlated with opposition to algorithmic um, government. So what we do is we ask our respondents in our European or Canadian surveys, whether they, um, uh, whether they fear job loss for themselves due to automation and AI in the future, whether they fear it for others and people like them. And we also ask them some questions about kind of populism generally. And what we wanna do is just see whether it's the possibility that this kind of widespread apprehension about the effects of automation and AI on job security and prosperity might be correlated with, with uh, uh, a, lack of, uh, a lack of belief that there's an acceptability of, of government using um, uh, 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 algorithms. Um, and what we do find is that all three of these beliefs, that, that job loss is coming through automation, that there will be increased inequality because of it, that there'll be limited social mobility because of AI are correlated with greater opposition to algorithmic government. And if I just show you the, the fits here, this is the relationship between a fear of job loss via automation and AI at an, at an individual level for individuals and for those around them, and the percent of reasons that people are willing to accept um, for government using um, um, 
uh, algorithms to make decisions. And you can see a pretty consistently negative effect across all of the countries in our sample. Um, and it obtains even if we look at our look at our subscales. So let me just give you the bottom lines, and then I'm happy to really happy to have questions. Um, have long questions, so I don't have to talk very much. Um, one is that uh, there's no single publicly acceptable justification for employing algorithms. There's no silver bullet that everybody likes. Um, it's a variation of reasons. And while they do get widespread support, you can find these pockets and sometimes concentrated pockets of opposition. Citizens have the status quo bias against the use of algorithms. Algorithms face a reputational challenge that humans don't. Um, and finally, there's the potential that the use of algorithms can be linked into um, um, other concerns around, around citizens that a good political entrepreneur might be able um, to marshal. Here are three concluding thoughts um, to this. Um, um, that, you know, there are more, there are multiple, I just want to emphasize that I believe there, you know, there are multiple barriers here to algorithmic government. I highlighted some of them at the start. Certainly these ideas of public opposition and scrutiny are not the only ones, far from it. I think they're important ones. These barriers are likely to have asymmetric effects though. So I think once you get over issues of implementation, you get over the challenges of actually doing it and putting it in place, it's amazing how much concentrated public opposition can forswear a government from doing something for a long time, even if all of the administrative logic suggests that it, that it should. And the final is that I think there's a very important distinction of government using digital technology for service delivery and government making decisions via, via um, algorithms. And we have to really not assume that these are the same thing. Um, so the challenge for those who want a government that's uh, modern and efficient and which is making use of kind of the, the massive explosion of knowledge that we have, have to recognize that, you know, it might be different tracks or different paths to get you to widespread usage in these two otherwise similar um, domains. Um, final point is thank you and I'll look forward to questions very much. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, do you maybe want to take your slide share off and we can we can happy to do screen? it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Nisar Shaw first for question. Thanks, Peter, for the for the wonderful talk. Uh, it's it was very engaging and I have a bunch of different questions. But uh, since you said that you prefer longer questions, so you have to talk less. I'll I'll start with the longer question. So uh, I was wondering at a high level. Uh, what your your thoughts are on ways to kind of buy more trust uh, in algorithms uh, from from regular citizens? So, for example, I, uh, there there was this one uh, group of researchers, including my PhD supervisor, uh, who, who uh, worked with a food bank in Pittsburgh uh, called Four One Two Food Rescue. And uh, so what they did is they automated this decision that this food bank has to regularly make, which is every time a, don a food donation comes in, they have to decide which nonprofit organization would this, uh, uh, would this uh, food donation go to. And uh, so instead of using kind of one algorithm that makes a decision, which, which would be very difficult for everyone to agree to, because uh, uh, some of the times the algorithm would make decision that you would not agree to, and then you would not kind of get trust into the algorithm. What they did is uh, they took a slightly different approach where they trained one machine learning model to learn the preferences of each stakeholder. So for each company, each company employee, each nonprofit representative and each driver who drives the food to a, a, a nonprofit organization, they learned a machine learning model that would basically mimic the kind of uh, 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 votes that these people would give. And then they, uh, so this machine learning model is a black box. And instead of trying to explain to them how the machine learning model works, they basically just, uh, uh, after kind of learning their, their, uh, their decisions from, from their own data, they showed uh, uh, these people what uh, the, the algorithm, how the algorithm thinks they would make the decision in some, some, uh, some random scenarios. And so basically they, they presented a scenario, asked these people to say, uh, what would you do in this situation? And then showed, look, here is the algorithm, here's the machine learning model that we learned based on your preferences. And this model would have made exactly the same decision in like 90% of the situations. And that kind of bought uh, the trust of these people into the, the model that is learned for them, that at least my, my voice would be taken into account uh, because the, there is this model that is learned specifically for my preferences. And then all these machine learning models are kind of uh, fed into a voting algorithm, uh, which is much simpler and much more easier to explain. So 
that that's kind of one thing that i i found very interesting because instead of trying to buy everyone's trust into one machine one kind of algorithm whatever that algorithm is which seems like a very difficult task because uh, like um, at least like 30 to 40% people uh, would disagree with the final decision that is made by the algorithm maybe right. the, that trust can be bought into the uh, kind of something that captures their voice into the final decision and then the the final decision making process can be explained so any thoughts that you have around this issue would be very welcome yeah that's a very interesting example and it's a very interesting example and there are let me let me just draw out maybe it'd be useful for me to draw what i think are useful parameters of that or dimensions of that example one is that you have there's presumably relatively high degree of trust because there's a voluntary relationship between the organizations that are that are involved with that food bank right and they can see why the algorithm is being put in place, right? They've got major allocation problems, but there's just a, there's got to be some, 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 some core of trust there for them to be to be working with 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 one another. The the second is that there's not a lot of people involved actually. So the so um, so you've got you've got not not that many organizations, um, not that many people to please. Um, they are very they're very um, they're probably quite invested in 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 that relationship because it actually returns things to them, right? Um, so it's a high stakes relationship in some sense. And then I wonder, I mean, maybe I could just ask you, do you have the sense that, that, the, that the magic was that the, that, the, that the aggregator could actually, could actually make decisions which were consistent with their preferences and that it was good at that and that, and that people could actually sense that and evaluate it? Or was it that they felt like it could? Right. So um, in, in the sense, in the sense, that if you just sort of said, look, this is how the, this, let me show you how the machine works. You think, oh, this is great. The machine took in, the machine took into consideration all of my preferences and I've been involved in the creation of it and therefore I support it. Right. Or is it they're saying, oh, but yeah, I would have made that decision. I would have made that decision. And they're taking some sort of running tally on what's actually decided by the machine and saying it is constant, I think, with the decisions I would make. So it's kind of outcome versus process, right? Right. So the final aggregator was basically just a very simple voting rule called BODA, where uh, uh, each yeah. kind of machine learning model would predict how this stakeholder would have ranked the different nonprofit organizations in terms of which organization should get this, uh, this right. next donation. Right. And then you just kind of assign points five, four, three, two, one, zero. And then you just add up the points and the, the, the nonprofit that gets the most number of points uh, uh, wins. So, so the kind of the key was to have a, a complex machine learning model that learns how this user would have uh, wanted to act in this situation. Uh, for that complex model, instead of trying to explain how the model works, you can just explain that indeed the model does make decisions exactly like you would have made this, the decisions and then have the final aggregator be something that is a very simple process, very explainable. Uh, that people can and just look at, understand, and then agree that yes, uh, this seems like a reasonable way to kind of make decisions. Right, right. But it's okay. So, but but then there's still a conflation of the two things there, right? For the, their understanding of the process for doing it, and their and then their their um, approval of the decisions that were made. Right. right? So and, both. And, and, right. So, so maybe both, need both maybe you only so, need one, right? But right. but it's, but, that's but, but that's an open but that's an open question, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, I mean, we can, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a that's an interesting question. Now, now we can contrast that with a whole number of other sets of problems that government might be trying to decisions government might be trying to make, right? Which are which are much closer to one shot decisions, where they're interacting with citizens on a, just a one off basis on some decision, or with 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 a lot of infrequency around a decision in which um, you know the decision do, the the citizen doesn't feel like they're a partner of the organization that's making the decision. You, if, if you're never going to feel like a partner of the Canada Revenue Agency. The way you might as a food bank, for example, right? And where and where um, the decision is just different, right? In the sense that it's not about making allocation where we could vote over it. Maybe it's a continuous decision, like how much tax should you actually have to pay? What does the government actually think your income was, right? Based on a bunch of things it can observe about your consumer behavior and 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 also official tax data that's gotten all sorts of things like that. So so I, I think that's a really compelling example, right? And probably a good use case of. A way, a way, and organizations have built trust together, and then have have decided to use uh, to use algorithms. Right, um, it's helpful until the Canada Food Bank comes along, but it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the point is that they're still happy to use it. But um, but how much those examples travel, I guess, it is a question, right? Yeah, but it's useful. It's a very useful example. Right. Uh, thank you. 
I, I let other thoughts. I'm looking, looking forward to chatting more. Uh, yeah, yeah. More. yeah. I, I have other questions, but I'll come back after we'll this. Come, we'll, we'll come back around to you. Thanks, thanks, Usar. Uh, can I go to Ashton? I see you, Jennifer. Yes. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thanks again for that awesome talk. That was really fascinating. Um, one. Yeah. So one thing that I've seen a lot in kind of any context where algorithm decision making is potentially you know, uh, competing with human uh, uh, decision making is, um, is that people, I think, hold algorithms to a standard that you, it wouldn't even be possible to hold humans to. Because like, I feel like algorithms can sometimes get knocked for like being transparent in a way that human decision making systems like people just can't be. Um, so like in the computer science community, you know, we can kind of rigorously measure the bias of algorithmic decision making systems right. that is right. very hard to do for people. Um, so I'm just wondering if that comes up in this context as well. Uh, and maybe just a second related question is, do you think the reputational problem with algorithms might go down as people become more and more, more just comfortable with algorithms and just they kind of continue to encroach in our lives? Yeah, there's a, the, the second question is, they're both very interesting questions and thanks, thanks very much for them. On the second one, um, we've had this discussion, uh, which is to say that I've been, I've been uh, bombarded with questions about it by, by the other research leads at SRI about what people think when they hear algorithm, right? Mm -hmm. And I actually, I mean, I'd like to just kind of set up a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of a conjoint or something to try to figure out, try to back out what people are thinking about when they hear about an algorithm and then what aspects of algorithms generate anxiety in them and which, which aspects generate senses of certainty or whatever it is. Right. But you could actually, you could actually do a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of work and I should do some on figuring out what it is about algorithms, what they think algorithms are and what it is that they, that they like about them or don't, uh, or don't like about them. Um, so, so I think that, I think that that goes partially to your question about what would happen when people learn to use, learn to see algorithms uh, more. I think that the, you know, if you, if you look at those experimental results suggest that there really is just a great big, there's a big fixed effect in terms of people's, mm -hmm. people's aversion, uh, aversion to them. Um, and I'm not sure you get it. Like we do a pretty good job within the instruments of trying to give a people a reasonable sense of what algorithms are. You know, they're a step-by-step -step guide for making a decision. Um, which would make the same decision every time it's given the same information. So it's not a we're not pushing them to have a to have a negative a negative a negative view of it. But I think that really the action is in that the action is in that in that in that relationship between intentions and decisions, right? And it's an interesting question about whether explainability actually solves that. It probably doesn't, right? So so imagine let me give you an example. Like imagine I make a I like did an experiment around this with politicians, right? Where we were, where we would write them and see what reasons they would give for the policies they've given, right? And politicians are, are they're not perfect, but they're pretty shrewd people, right? So if you if you write a politician and you say, I saw you voted this way on a gun control bill, um, or a gun control bill is coming up, why? Which way are you going to vote? They'll tell you. The majority will tell you which way they're going to vote because it's going to be public. A smaller subset of them will tell you. Um, uh, uh, will give you a reason for why they're gonna vote in that, in that fashion. And here's, here's the logic behind why they don't wanna do it, right? So you ask me, well, why, why would I support vote to support gun control? And I say, well, I really think we should keep guns out of the hands of criminals. And you say, well, that's, that sounds very good. I really like your reason. But if you ask me the question, I respond, well, I think all men are violent uh, and therefore no men should have firearms because each one of them is a threat to their spouse. If you're, you may find that deeply offensive, right? So while you agreed with my decision, you don't like my rules, right? You don't like the reasons that I, the reasons that I gave you. So you can find more, the more reasons I give, the more opposition you can find to me. And if opposition is asymmetrical to support, then it doesn't help to have more reasons. And I think it's a very interesting question about whether explainability actually helps algorithms or not, right? Um, and if I give you more and more of the justification for why an algorithm made a decision, you've got less and less certainty about, about whether that algorithm might agree with you. Whereas if Jillian makes a decision that I disagree with, it hasn't happened yet, but if Jillian makes a decision I disagree with and I don't, and I don't like the decision, I can still back out good reasons for why she would make, even make the same decision differently in the future. When she looks at it again, she'll think about this. Or when she, you know, if she, if she only sees my point of view, the more we talk about it, next time the decision will change. So I think that gets harder to, to that gets harder. Uh, it doesn't necessarily get easier, certainly, when you have more transparency around, around algorithms. So I think that's an interesting 
an interesting challenge, right? Um, an interesting, an interesting challenge for it. To your first point about, and I think that goes to your first point about being able to measure, being able to measure bias, right? Mm -hmm. um, being able to measure bias, and you know, I mean, there are there are combinations here, obviously, right? I mean, we can use AI to try to to try to we can use we can use all sorts of even simpler tools, but to try to flatten out the bias of of decision makers, right? When they're when they're making adjudicatory decisions, right? Or uh, but but yeah, I think I think our intuitions about about transparency and explainability, as opposed to um, agreement with the outcome, which gets a little bit to uh, uh, to the earlier point, is it, is one where our intuitions probably lead us in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Great. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Brian. Yeah. Hi. So, you can you hear? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so thanks, Peter. Um, I, you know, having spent my life wrestling with AI, I, I, there's something that troubles me under underlying this, which is that my sense is that concepts and categories, the sorts of things for which we use words like sex, employed, all this kind of stuff, aren't captured in the word um, in any way. Um, that those uh, human use of words are merely sort of signals into the cluster of understanding that actually underwrites what it is to be employed or to be a parent or to be married or something like this. And to say, therefore, that, I mean, this is why I don't trust algorithms. I wouldn't want algorithms to be used in this kind of governance because the we don't have any computers that can actually grasp what I think is the substance of the concept. It can merely use a category of that name. And so to actually, associate that if the computer does something by categorizing it under a, you know, a database column or something like that with that name is a very shallow sense of whether it is in fact using the same concept or not. So this is gonna make me look as if I have pro status quo <coughs> or trust humans. Um, and, and I worry that this generates a kind of behaviorism in, in, in the analysis. So you say, look, in this particular case, the computer made exactly, the, let's say Jillian and a computer make exactly the same decision. Um, I guess my sense is there's no way they can make the same decision. It may end up eventuating in the same behavior, but my sense is Jillian, if she decides that somebody is unemployed or married or, 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 or an immigrant or God knows what, that will be based on her human understanding of what it, what those, what the concepts that we use those names for actually represents with respect to a sort of total understanding of the world. Um, and that there's no way an algorithm, even if it uses that same word, can grasp that category. And I think that comes up a lot in, so for example, the trolley problem issue, um, and I have lots of students who work on driverless cars um, and your, your surgeon example of it, you know, it kind of reminds me of when we were arguing against the Reagan government to not use computers for launch on warning in the Cold War and stuff. And they would say, look, you know, what, would you rather, you don't want computers to control launching warning systems, would you rather a, a sort of drunk 18 year old soldier wakes up at six o'clock in the morning and, and we tell the soldier, look, push this button. If that light goes green and the light goes green and they push the button, is that human control? And our feeling was, look, stop. That this, <laughs> you shouldn't be deciding the fate of Europe on six months in warning. It shouldn't be a binary case. It, it's just to assume that the system, that the issue can be captured in a small number of sort of discrete, sharp edged, categories that you're using certain words for is already to do an injustice to the system. So, so that's my worry. I'm not quite sure where it comes down on your ultimate point, but my concern is that the concepts and categories of the law aren't actually just, you know, discrete binary categories that those words get used for. They actually our indexes into a human understanding of a much more complex um, kind of parse of the human condition. Are you, is, is your concern here about the, uh, it, it, it's a, it's a deep point. So, so I want to push on a little bit and then we sure, need to sure, talk a little yeah. more, but is right. your, is your concern here about the, the ability of the decision maker algorithm or human 
to draw on the correct set of considerations to understand that the problem in front of it is related to to some set of concerns and contracts and not another set and the quality of the decision either empirically and morally and normally is going to depend on the the things that it draws on rather than the outcome is that is that is that the concern well um I would put it this way. The problem with saying draw on a set of concerns or something like this, another set of concerns, is that there might be an assumption that a set of concern could be captured in an articulated sentence of whether they're, you know, married or whether they're black or whether they're, you know, got a U of T degree and all this kind of stuff, that concerns could actually be captured <laughs> in kind of a set of formal symbols. And my sense is that human judgment is not anything we would want to warrant as human judgment can't be captured in in anything as simple as concerns articulated in terms of discrete words that no yeah. discrete word yeah. captures i mean this is why um you know some of the laws of the sea and stuff say well look go right here and do so and so and so forth then then and above all else do the right thing or do the safe thing and stuff right. because there's a recognition that the words can't capture that on which you should rely right right but then this is but this is so so then if, if we're interested in it seems to me maybe that if we're interested in allocating resources then then this actually that may well recommend for more algorithmic decision making or, or, or for a different allocation of algorithmic decision making, right? Because when you get into things like, so let me give you an example. I mean, I'm thinking about actually Avi's paper from a couple of weeks ago, right? About human human decisions around 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 granting refugee status, right? Which is like right. that's right. really that's really complicated. Yep. Right. Like a well founded fear of persecution is a very hard right. thing to establish. It has it has it has you know there's a whole bunch of legal tenants around it, but but that's actually about language, right? And and those are well founded fear of persecution, like. Boy, every sent every word in that sentence except for of, right, is uh, is uh, is debatable, right? Um, right, right. The question about the question of 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 how much tax you owe on money you've made. Once we establish the money you've made, you get around some issues of categorization of what's a capital gain or what's not, right? And, and I, I I'll concede that those issues are a bit are a bit debatable. I have friends who are accounting professors, and I always object if I use an example of this. But these things are are are. So it's some debate, but but those are areas where where I think you can have a mapping with less uncertainty between the the, the concept and it's and, it, and the language you use around it. If you want to, if you want to think about it that way, so why so why do we have why do we have people at CRA making adjudications rather than computers right around around some of these issues right and then going in and listening to a person argue out why they thought this was a capital gain or it wasn't or how this did or didn't further their business right. Um, so there seems to me that there are some things where it is actually simpler because 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 it, it is in a maybe it's because it's already in a domain that's already um, numerical or because it's just the concepts are simpler where you know maybe the argument is put more put more humans into more complex things put more you know things that are conceptually complex put computers into things where there's much less challenges of, of classification so that that suggests there's not a uniform strategy right and I take your I take your point and I guess I mean you're not claiming because you you made this clear on two things you said that you're not sure which way this cuts actually in terms of using algorithms or not, right? But I think we could agree that those categorization problems you're talking about are not constant, right? There, there's variation in those in terms of the types of problem that we're talking about. So, I mean, we don't puzzle over whether a calculator can add, right? So, um, uh, correctly. Right, I mean, but I guess, I mean, let me just say one more thing and then, you know, I should let it go on to other people, but calculator case, the concepts are, are pretty well defined and closed. Right. And in that case, we want to trust. It seems to me with respect to, I mean, you made a distinction, I don't have your slide in front of me, but between um, you know using capital technical, computational technology for the delivery of government services versus actually employing algorithmic decision making in the um, actual adjudication. It seems to me that in the adjudication, we might want to look at the, decision-making process and find those parts of it, which in fact are more involved in clear categories and use computers to help there and, and, and reserve the human judgment for the cases where the 
you know, not only the, the cases, but for the places within any given judgment and also for the cases where the issues of, comp of uh, categorization and classification in fact are serious and sort of develop a kind of amanuensis role for the AI system. Right, right, right. right. And well, figuring that sure. out would be really useful, I think. Sure. I mean, I mean, go. Let's let's just I mean go back to this quickly. This example about and, and this is partially people mean with that, but human in the loop maybe. But go back to this example of the food banks, right? Um, where like, you know, those preferences that were developed are probably conditional upon some sense of need, right? And there's knowledge about the individuals who receive this and the organizations who receive it, so they build up a preference model on that, right? And then suddenly COVID hits and unemployment doubles, right? Well, maybe need has changed. Right? So maybe then it's useful to have an interlocutor who says, this is what the algorithm is now deciding. How do we feel about it? Right? Let's talk about it. Right. And let's, let's talk about whether it's consistent with the thing that we now understand to be, to be need. That works in a circumstance where you have someone to talk to, right. Where, where interlocution can happen between, between the actors. In other circumstances where it's about government's bilateral relationships with a very, very large number of citizens, but they're not a collective having that conversation with the, with the principal setting up the, the, the machines to make the decision for them, that gets more complicated. Well, Thanks, maybe we'll, Peter, okay, sorry, I'll shut up. <laughs> sorry, Brad, okay. So I have, I have four people on the list here. We've got a little bit over 15 minutes. Jennifer, Anthony, Benjamin, then Nico. Jennifer. Hey, so thanks so much for Peter for that. That was really interesting. Um, I'm curious about the sort of status quo bias effect here. And um, I think one of the most striking things that I, I think you've, you've pointed out elsewhere is that you're getting pretty similar results from countries which have very different levels of, uh, of engagement with algorithmic governance. Yes. And, um, and so there's something maybe a little curious about the extent to which people are responding that they'd like things to stay the way they are if their mm -hmm. domestic experience should reflect very different levels of exposure to algorithmic governance, which makes me think actually maybe just people don't know very much about how much algorithmic governance is already going on in their in their environment. I'm yeah, curious, like yeah. you mentioned the deception experiment that you're thinking of. Um, that you're thinking of trying out. And I, I'm wondering what your hypothesis is going in on that. What, what would you expect to see? Would you expect to see um, people just resisting any change or would you expect still to see um, a preference for the human? Yeah, I mean, I wonder if, I think we could probably do it without deception the more I think about it, which is good, but, uh, but you can imagine a situation in which you're pushing things on two dimensions, right? One is, so one is that, that question of in which, in which direction innovation is going. It's going towards, towards more algorithmic systems making more or less. Um, and you could you can manipulate that. And the other is to draw the distinction between decision-making and, and kind of service delivery, right? So um, if Thomas Ilves was here, who was the old president of Estonia who kind of digitized the country, who, who was at Casvis when I was there. So whenever I gave any version of this talk, he'd be like, it's all easy to do, right? He never, he never wanted to get digitized himself. Right. He never thought the role of president should be turned over to an algorithm. It turns out. Right. But everything else, everything else could be. So I think making the distinction between even in these countries like Estonia that are deeply, deeply digitized, whether they people there actually think that, that decisions about how they interact with government ought to be made by an algorithm, you know, in terms of ju whether judgment should be made is an open question, I think. Right. So so it's it, it's a different set and a different kind of decisions than than simply people's experience of whether they can get a driver's license or a marriage certificate or, or some other service online, right? So I think making a distinction, and there'll, there'll be a dimension there between judgments down to services and then you know what, which, in which direction the innovation is happening, whether it's towards more humans or towards more um, algorithms would be a much better way to run the experiment. Great, thanks. Okay, and I'm gonna say jump a little bit here to Anthony. Thank you, Gillian. Um, so, uh, hi, Peter. I love the hi, Nice, nice like, to see you. Very good to see you too. Very sympathetic to all four of the reasons. Um, just, I, I, I just wonder if, if, um, if, if there's almost a false dichotomy between human decisions and algorithmic decisions. And so we're jumping straight to algorithmic decision making here. And really, I think of this thing as more like a grade. And so yes. you take your surgeon example. I just wonder if there's a possibility to say, well, the, the uh, administrator was advised by an algorithm or was guided or suggested. And so there's this middle ground in between human 
algorithm decision making and really it's you know a combination of two i wonder if you can learn something there and then you could better understand the obstacles um about whether um we're we're, we're happy to have this um an algorithm advising or guiding or suggestion and the second thing is if you want to look under the hood a bit of uh, status quo i wonder if the reverse um status quo bias is there too. If you were to give people uh, a situation where the law is, you know, decisions are being made by algorithms, and then you said, should we change it up to human decision making? Do you think you'd get the same status quo bias? Or do you think, and essentially what I'm asking is, the reverse question is, what are the obstacles to human decision making? Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, you, and you, you could extend it beyond what I was discussing with Jennifer, where you could you could emphasize different varying degrees of human bias, right, and see whether 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 you can deplete support for human human decision making. Um, on the on the first point, I think I mean I think there's certainly an element of a dimension there. It would be interesting to I mean you could imagine there's a very simple series of vignettes you could run to to have a mix of where the algorithm comes into the process, where you're varying where the algorithm is. Is just making input or making some final decision. So some mix of how much algorithmic input there is versus human, and then and then to the nature of the kind of inputs that it's that it's making, for example, right? And whether those are and then there's all sorts of distributional things. By the way, you could you could bring in right, like are we like how do people feel about about algorithms making you know um, allocating tax burdens, right? If 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 the overall tax burden is is equal, right, uh, across the population in terms of the total revenue, right, or do they? Do they worry that it's that in fact they don't like it because it's going to have it's just going to generate more revenue, right? Or the distribution revenue is going to change in a way they don't like. So there's all sorts of elements that I think are that are there's all sorts of nuances that would be interesting to get at. Um, not least uh, not least the the relative positioning of the algorithm and and its admixture, as you say, along with the human. Great, thanks very much, uh, Nico. So Peter, uh, well, that was great. Uh, I love this stuff. Um, I was wondering, uh, and maybe you said it at the beginning, I, I joined a little later. Uh, so it looks as though the focus on, of this uh, questionnaire is uh, um, on rules, essentially, who should do uh, what, but uh, not about potential outcomes. I, I was wondering if you thought about uh, presenting people different scenarios where you give some estimates of, for example, the you know, the efficiency advantages, the cost savings from using algorithm or, and see whether the decision, the, the support uh, would change. In other words, whether uh, people have an opposition to who makes the rules or how well uh, they can make a decision, uh, essentially. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, the, so the first, and this is not to say you, uh, uh, the first set of results is, was, was at least partially about the, the, the kind of welter of reasons that people might might put together for why for why they support algorithmic government and part of that is about you know efficiency versus fairness sure. type considerations but i think but i think that there's another element you're getting at which is not about the reasons but about the outcomes right and varying those outcomes right and many people don't care about bias right but they care about efficiency right so in in in, in, in the actual quality of decisions that are or the types of decisions that are made so that's a very that's a very reasonable um that's a very reasonable um, extension um, extension as well, right? And and you know, and, and there's obviously questions about whether those concerns are are, ego, are egoistic or pro-social, right? And you can imagine variations and setups in which yeah. you've got a human maker making some distributional allocation, and you can see whether or not people's support for that is conditional upon not the distribution, but to how it helps them, right? Or or vice versa. So that's a those are really helpful prompts. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Avi. Hi. Um, so I'm trying to, this is really interesting. I'm trying to get my head around what it really means for a machine to make a decision. So the way, the way I'd always thought about it um, is there's no such thing as a machine decision, at least with our current machines. Sorry about that. Uh, we have human decisions. What machines do is change the humans who make the decisions. And so we move from a human, maybe low level bureaucrat on the ground to a different bureaucrat who decides a scoring rule based on some prediction. So for example, in our university system in Canada, you, get, you might get into a university if you have a you know, 80 average or above. 
is that a machine decision or is that a human decision? I think it's a human decision. I think, but it's also a machine decision. And I'm just trying to think through within this framework, how do we, uh, you know, are machines deciding or are, you know, humans, or are they just allowing different humans to decide by allowing some human decisions to scale? Well, okay. So let's use let's use the the, the emissions one, the emission example, right? So we so we set up an emission scheme in which we in which we uh, you know we have a number of criteria that we specify you know numerically for or, or, or logically about who we want to let in, and then students apply and and basically you know we just we just process their applications in a way, and, and then and then and then we let them in, we don't let them in, and and we we might check to make sure that the applications that are let in are logically consistent with the criteria that we created, right? And and there, you write the question, who, who was making the decision, right? And the decision was made by the registrar and whoever else set up that scheme, right? And that it was made by that decision, it was implemented by the machine, right? But what about if we then feed back into that machine some data on how well those students performed, we do that conditional upon their observables, um, and then we use that to choose choose uh, citizens in the future. Well, you can say that's fine. I mean, it's still us deciding to do that and we can still understand who we're choosing, right? But what if that conditioning on the observables, you know, rather than just doing it through machine learning or through some simple econometrics or something, we, we actually let we let the AI come up with a predictive model about who's more likely to, to, to succeed such that we don't understand the predictions that it's making, the basis of the predictions that it's making. So I, is there a normative distinction when we get to the point where, where Effectively, the machine is an agent, and, and we and we're not perfectly supervising it. Okay, because um, then the machine's doing. Then the machine has liberty, right? Okay, well, that, that's more your domain than mine. Um, I'll take your word for well, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would think about it. So this, I would think about this much more in terms of probabilistic decision making and decision making under uncertainty, which is the person who allocate who delegates. Um, you know, who determines the reward function and then says, okay, machine, go act. Um, that person has some distribution, expected distribution over what's going to happen. Um, that expected distribution could be well-defined or, or not, yeah. depending yeah. on how things yeah. operate. It's still the human delegating to the machine, but a human delegating to a machine under, or sorry, it's still a human making the decision to delegate, you know, uh, Joshua Gann says, you know, no human ever lost a job to a machine. Humans lost a job because some other human decided to give that job to a machine. Uh, this feels a lot like that. Um, yeah, a little bit, right? Until you're, until you're, until you're, the, until there's, there's two twins, uh, you know, track and trigger and they, and they both decided to apply to, to U of T and, and they have ostensibly the same, they ostensibly have the same records, right? I mean, they were, and they, and they took all their classes together, right? And one played squash and one played tennis or something like that, right? And then one of them gets into U of T and one doesn't, right? And then they call up and they just say, well, who can I talk to about this? Or their mother calls up, right? Who can I talk to about this travesty? And no one can figure out why track got it and trigger didn't, right? And then, and then, you know, it, it may be that someone doesn't understand the algorithm or it may be that the, you know, if you get into true learning, that the, that the, that the AI learned something about them conditional upon these very, very small differences, right? And you can say that that's just, that's just in an uncertainty term or something like that, right? But, it's, but if it's unanticipated um, and if it's inexplicable, and I'm not sure that a person was making that decision, right? Um, but then, I, mean, I mean, now we're getting, into very, now we're getting into, very, into very theoretical stuff, I guess, or philosophical stuff, but we, I, you know, we, could, we, could, we could imagine a continuum of how much, of, of how much agency the principal is giving the AI, right? Um, and how much the principal could anticipate the decision that would be made by the AI if presented with the same with the same decision, and I think that would be indicative of independence. So, oh, that makes sense because I, yeah, I would say you know, back to your point on decision support versus automation, right? This seems or human in a loop. This seems like debate. The the degree of uncertainty is you know what should be is likely to be correlated with the desire for decision support as opposed to automation, and that's yeah, that's fair. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Um, uh, so uh, uh, Benjamin's going to get our last question, and thank you, Benjamin, for letting me move him, move him around in the list. Uh, but we're going to get to you. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Yeah. So I was I was sort of uh, interested in something that kind of came up early in the presentation, where you talked about sort of advantages of AI governance, and one of them was this kind of consistency. That kind of got me thinking. Like, I wonder whether that's actually an advantage. So I was thinking of cases like 
you know, one of the worries about the use of AI in say banking is that now if all the bank companies are using the same algorithm, if you're rejected by one, you're gonna be rejected by all of them. Or the fact that all these companies are now using the same hiring software, right? So then if you're sort of, you know, you could be sort of caught by this really wide net. And so I, I wonder, I mean, obviously there's only one government. There's not these competing governments in quite the same way as they're competing banks. But we might almost think like, um, it's kind of like a good thing, especially because we don't know who's gonna have their hand on the controls of the AI exactly. We might like prefer that there's kind of a distribution, maybe even a pretty wide distribution of results um, rather than say, you know, because like there's kind of this friction between the decision makers and like say what the politicians might want, but maybe, and that could be a good thing, right? That it's not so easy for the new government to just adopt the, change the algorithm and suddenly everything changes. Um, that human beings making the decision are sort of more stubborn and sort of gonna, ha gonna go their own way more often. So what, is that something you've thought about in the context of, of this sort of um, use of AI in governance? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really nice articulation of the notion that everybody wants to be heard, right? And that, and that, and that logic, that logic underwrites a lot of the most inefficient systems we have in government, right? So, you know, there's a, there's a backlog of like a quarter of a million people in the VA in the United States who are waiting for their cases to be heard around their disability benefits, right? And once they get in front of a human, they're going to have about seven minutes to make their case in front of that human who's going to have considered their case for another 10 minutes. I don't know, man. Like that's, it sounds like it's great to be heard, right? But it doesn't sound like that's working very well. You know, so there is, I mean, there really is, because we have, not least because uh, with, with no offense to our, to our colleagues in law, because we have so elevated the, the practice of law and, 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 and the belief of what one needs to know to make fair judgments, we have a human problem, right? Like we actually have a scale problem in actually being able to adjudicate, um, adjudicate, uh, prop, uh, adjudicate allocations and all sorts of things that government, the government does, right? But there are other solutions to this, right? Like government just gives everybody the same amount of money or spend of who they are or something. Like there are actually other technological solutions to it. But boy, government's a scale problem, right? Um, it's a, it's really a, it's really a, it's, it's really a problem of scale. The final thing I'll leave you with, right? And, and, and someone else, if anyone wants to talk about this offline, I'd really be thrilled to think of talk about it, right? But, but, um, and this just makes me like, a, I'm just like a kind of like a shitty, uh, Her Herbert Simon impersonator here, but it's really interesting to think about government actually already as a system of AI, right? If you're a government decision maker at the top, if you're, if you're a cabinet minister or a deputy minister, the volume of decisions you have to make in a day is massive. And there's a huge, huge um, information infrastructure underneath you, which takes data and tries to come up with recommendations consonant with some preferences that you've stated to it. And there's a reward function there, right? And they give you all sorts of decisions and, and they boil two up to you and they ask you to make one. And you do that all day as a politician, right? And at such a volume that you often have a machine that signs your name for you, like a little mechanical thing that signs your, signs your name. And there's all sorts of opacity in that. There's a bunch of black boxes, black boxes in it, right? Um, I mean, it's kind of the original, it's, it's, it's one of the original AI systems, right? That there's a bunch of intelligence and learning going on beneath you. You can't observe, but you have to, but you have to trust, right? Um, so this is just about, when you think about it that way, it makes the use of algorithms a bit more justifiable because the whole system is already based on all the, you know, a lot of these same assumptions we have to take as given to, to allow for algorithmic governance. Great. Algorithmic government. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Peter, for a terrific talk and for everybody for a wonderful conversation. Uh, I think we've got places to go. Yes, indeed. Uh, next week, we have Nisarg Shaw. Um, up talking about fairness in algorithmic decision making, theory and application. So uh, hopefully we'll see you all back here next week. Thanks again. Bye everyone. Thanks. Thanks very much, everyone. Very much.